Can everybody hear me? All right. Uh, so first, I want to start by asking uh, how many of you actually are aware of what a distributed denial of service attack is, and uh, how many of you have actually been hit by one? All right. So we have people who know what it is. Uh, so uh, the way the talk is going to proceed, uh, I'm going to talk about what a, a distributed denial of service attack is, different kinds, and then uh, I'll talk about mitigation. Uh, so First, I'm going to talk about myself. Who am I? I'm a current uh, operations engineer at Flipkart. Uh, I've been uh, doing the internet since 2005, and I've worked with a whole bunch of companies. If you want to reach me, I mean, this is the LinkedIn address. Uh, so what is a DDoS? I think this picture is a very good representation. <laughs> I mean, if you want to consider the train as the service that you're hosting on a website, and you know all the people are trying to get on board, uh, so the DDoS can either uh, cripple your service or you know cause a complete outage. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. What are the different kinds of the, uh, attacks? Uh, first, we have the volumetric attack. Uh, it's mostly uh, an attack which is actually trying to consume all the bandwidth that you have. It is not necessarily uh, causing an outage of your service, it's just making it unavailable. Uh, very common uh, methods are DNS amplification, SNMP, NTP, and SYN floods, and also fragmentation. Uh, DNS, as you know, is uh, based on UDP. So one of the biggest challenges here is there is no connection that's established, like there's no three-way handshake, etc. So an attacker, what he does is he sp uh, spoofs the victim's IP address and sends a request. So ISC is a very common target, uh, not a common target, uh, a place where the attacks originate from. So if you do a dig, uh, I forget what the exact query is, the response that you get is about 3 MB in size. Uh, so the query that you send is about 100 bytes, and the response is 3 MB. Uh, so the attacker sends a, re a request with, suppose, my IP address, so I get like 3 MB of uh, data, which I never requested for. It does not hurt me in any way, but the thing is, the request come to the firewall, and I drop them, but they are choking the internet pipe. Uh, second is the SYN flood. Um, how many of you know you can stop it using SYN cookies, or will actually suggest using SYN cookies? Uh, but the thing is, uh, if it gets fairly large, uh, you start having a problem with sin cookies because uh, you run out of uh, the limited set that you have and the server then decides to randomly start dropping uh, sessions. And uh, fragmented packets, well, these are a, a problem with uh, firewalls or systems because uh, they require uh, extra computing power. The system has to reassemble the packet and uh, only then it can look at the uh, content of the packet and can decide you know what uh, it needs to do with it moving on to application layer attacks application layer attacks are slightly more complicated volumetrics was limited more to layer 7 uh, sorry layer 4 application is more towards layer 7 uh, recently one of the attacks that we've seen is a wordpress ping back uh, I'm not 100% sure what it is, but from what I've gathered, it is uh, a ping back from the WordPress server. So if you link a site on your WordPress, WordPress uh, keeps sending a request, a ping back to the uh, address. Uh, so we saw a couple of thousand requests coming in recently, um, exploiting HTTP. Uh, this is a hybrid attack. Uh, in this, what we'd seen was, uh, we very aggressively compress uh, responses, HTTP responses. And uh, we saw users had sent uh, HTTP requests specifically with the uh, compression disabled. So it caused a huge spike in our bandwidth. And uh, we, I think we got to like 90, 95% of our internet connection and they start, the ISP start dropping packets. So it's not a good experience. <coughs> Excuse me. The last one is incomplete request. Uh, so as you're aware, in HTTP 1.1, uh, 
you need at least two parts of data. One is the actual request, like a get or a post. And the second is the host header. You can also have other details like cookies, etc. But uh, that's optional. So in this case, what an uh, attacker does is, he will send the uh, first line of data, he send the get URL, and then he'll just wait for some time before he actually sends the host header. So let's say he waits for like five or 10 seconds and he sends the host header. Uh, so in HTTP 1.1, you have to uh, finish a request by having two new line characters. Uh, so I can send one and wait for another 10, 15 seconds before sending the last one. Now, the problem with this is it's consuming sessions at the uh, web server. It's not causing any other problem. And uh, this attack actually is a very sophisticated attack. In this, we had seen, uh, I think, uh, we'd seen a couple of th hundred, uh, thousand requests, and the increase in bandwidth was about less than an MB or close to an MB. Uh, so it's a very hard to detect attack if you don't know what you're looking for. And it took us quite a while to actually figure out uh, what was the problem. Uh, what are the steps for mitigation? So we'll start with the uh, mitigation of volumetric attacks. Uh, for us, we own our own uh, address space, IP address space, and we advertise it with different ISPs using BGP. Um, so if, uh, and this is actually a very specific use case, if uh, the attack is localized to one particular ISP, in our case, we are multi-homed, uh, multi and we, have, we are peering with uh, more than one ISP. So if ISP A is getting, uh, uh, if the attack is coming via ISP A, what I do is I will disable my advertisements there. This only works if the attack is not directed at me, but at the ISP. I mean, when you're establishing peering, you also have the uh, ISP's address in there. Uh, the second is working with upstreams. Uh, again, this is for uh, large volumes. Um, we contact our upstream and have them specifically black hole our IP addresses for certain providers. An example of this could be, uh, say we have an IS, uh, or a lot of uh, requests are coming in from an ISP in Ukraine. We can have our upstream provider black hole us for Ukraine. But you know, it's a little dicey be uh, because you might not, might not just get blocked for Ukraine, but maybe the entire Europe. So there's a little gray area there. And the last one is use of scrubbing farm. So when all else fails, I mean, India has limited uh, bandwidth connectivity, and the ISPs are, uh, you know, they don't want to give it to you without, if you don't want to pay for it. Um, so what they'll do is they will black hole you very, very fast. And we've had ISPs black hole us a bunch of times. So in that case, what we do is we switch over to a scrubbing farm. This is basically a third-party um, DDoS mitigation service. We change our DNS and let our traffic flow via the scrubbing farm, where they mitigate the attack and send it back to us. The other is a application layer attack. So for this, we have two solutions. One is a homegrown solution. I'll talk about it more in detail. And the other is, again, falling back to the uh, scrubbing farm. The, the homegrown solution that we have is, again, limited by the amount of bandwidth that we have, the cap uh, capability. So beyond, a, if we can do up to median levels of attacks, or uh, like I uh, talked about, uh, the incomplete request attack, these kind of attacks can be mitigated by us, because they don't require a lot of bandwidth. So wherever bandwidth comes into play, we have to fall back to scrubbing farms. So before I actually talk about uh, the solution that we have, I want to talk about why we built our own, build versus buy. Uh, so we built our own because we know our application better than anybody else. We know what the flow is supposed to be, how the user, uh, uh, what the user's journey is through our website. So we are, the best person, people, and we can uh, identify malintent very, very quickly. Uh, secondly, we want to understand the attack and evolve with it. Uh, but this, again, is subject to the complexity of the attack. At times, we've had uh, the attacker using only one, uh, one vector. So it's not really a sophisticated attack. I mean, it could be them trying to just do NTP, and once you take care of an NTP application, they stop. 
but at times the moment you stop NTP, they hop onto a different vector. So in that case, we want to know exactly what is going on, and hence we want to evolve with it. The third is uh, the service providers have a very generic solution. They all want to sell you a web application firewall. Web application firewalls are good, but they only work when you talk about XSS or SQL injection. Uh, they are not aware of how our application works. Uh, most of them do not have enough intelligence to, you know, build a profile of my application. So, it's sort of not a, uh, not a feasible solution. So, what do we do? We do real-time log analysis. We aggregate all our logs from uh, all uh, internet-facing applications and firewalls. Uh, using Logstash, we get them all into Elasticsearch. And once uh, they're there, we identify uh, standard patterns, you know, just things that we've looked in the past. We use those, and then uh, we also work with the application. Every application does its own uh, request profiling. So within the Flipkart website, you have a checkout or a commenting service or different services. They will uh, profile the request and see if the user is, uh, you know, following a pattern. I mean, if you are, suppose, just continuously searching on the Flipkart website and we see 500 requests, you know, you're not really a, a, you, a customer because you will search and actually go somewhere. 500 requests, uh, just search requests is not something that's a positive sign. I mean, and uh, the other, is, so what we do with this is, once we have this, the uh, applications give us feedback uh, using a custom error code. Um, so instead of, say, HTTP 403 or uh, 404, we will use something like a 999. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we are, again, doing real-time log analysis. So once we see that, we pick that data up and we go ahead and block it on the firewall. I mean, there are a couple of steps here. Uh, we use different error codes. So you can either block it on the firewall, or if you want to start rate limiting it, uh, we can do that as well. And the third option is uh, the uh, request profiler itself can present a captcha to the uh, customer. Uh, that actually happens in the case of uh, people who are behind a NAT, uh, mostly for offices or uh, college campuses, etc., where we have a large number of genuine users who we do not want to block by blocking the IP address. What are the challenges that are currently associated with this? Uh, what we've seen is uh, response times. Uh, in the last, uh, I think it was about two months ago, we had a very interesting attack pattern. We saw attacks which, which would last for about five minutes. So by the time we got on VPN, we logged in, and you know to figure out what's going on, it was all gone. So it was a cat and mouse game, it was just very difficult. Uh, so we wanted to automate it. Hence, uh, but not everything is automate, uh, can be automated, so response time again is a challenge. The second is a maturity of mitigation solutions from ISPs. All the ISPs we've talked to, all the third party uh, mitigation providers we've talked to, Everybody has is reselling the same solution. Uh, it's basically Arbor Box, and they're just selling a subscription for that. Uh, so, and the solution that they have actually works very well for Layer Four, uh, but does not do anything at Layer Seven. Uh, and the other thing is, even the Arbor solution that the ISPs have in India, they do not have enough knowledge about or hands-on experience with the DDoS mitigation. So, they I mean, it's not really effective. Uh, an example of this is uh, we were getting uh, we were getting hit by an NTP ap amplification attack, and uh, the mitigation provider decided to go ahead and enable all defenses available in Arbor uh, for our IP address. And one of the mitigations is also HTTP authentication using uh, HTTP Digest. Uh, that is to basically uh, uh, differentiate between a machine and a real user. So what happened was they, I mean, while trying to mitigate uh, mitigate an attack, they actually started one because about, I think, 70 or 80 percent of our users just dropped off uh, once that happened. Uh, then the other problem is the Indian ISPs are not flexible. 
they are still operating uh, in the past. I mean, like we have the cloud model where we can go swipe our credit card and we have machines ready and we have everything available. Uh, I can't have anything like that uh, with the ISPs. I mean, I can't have them provision fat pipes for me and, uh, you know, I only pay for them when I use them. If I'm, they want, if they're provisioning a fat pipe for me, they want me to pay, it, uh, pay for it regardless of whether or not I'm using it. So that is a very, uh, the cost is a very big barrier. Uh, the fifth point is, uh, yeah, fifth point is uh, black holing of uh, our traffic. Uh, the ISPs are very quick in black holing your IP address. Uh, you know, if they've tried uh, their mitigation solution, it's not, hap uh, it's not helping. They've tried, uh, their knowledge of DDoS is reaching a level where they can't do anything. Um, and we are, you know, our, the attack on us is actually hurting our neighbor also. And I mean, even an attack as small as 10 GB hurts the neighbor. I mean, we've been victims and I'm sure uh, we've affected other people also. So they're very quick in black holing uh, traffic and uh, they, do, they do not inform. I mean, communication is a very big problem. Um, at times, I think it was about 15 or 20 minutes later, we found out we had been black holed. I mean, that was not a thing we were looking for. Uh, later on, we became more active in monitoring our availability outside of India. Uh, and the last is there are no scrubbing farms in India. So when we utilize scrubbing farms, uh, you have uh, things like uh, Cloudflare, Ultra DNS, or uh, even Arbor has their own uh, scrubbing farm. They're all located outside of India. In Flipkart, we very aggressively monitor uh, end user latency. Uh, hence, we are multi home Hence, we uh, actually decided to host in India versus going to Singapore or US or something like that. But once we go to scrubbing farms, the latencies are just out of the window. And uh, there is no telling. At times, you know, we've been told we are actually going to a scrubbing farm in Singapore. But again, it depends on the volume of the attack. The ISP sometimes does uh, move to a scrubbing farm in Europe or America. What that actually does is introduce 2x latency for the end user. And they have to first go and connect to the scrubbing farm. Then the scrubbing farm will actually proxy a request on their behalf to us, uh, get the response, and then send it back to the user. So that's like 2x latency for the end users. Um, so these are the challenges that we've had. And if you have any questions. Hi. Uh can you throw some more light on scrubbing farms, as in what all services uh, do these farms provide? And uh, The scrubbing farms are uh, mostly black boxes. Uh, what they do is they're, they're sort of reverse proxies. They also do uh, pattern identification. And uh, if you want to think of them, just think of it like a farm of Nginx servers or HA proxy servers. Uh, who will take your request in? And then you can apply filters there. So let's say if I was... Uh, if I identified a particular user agent that was bad, like in case of WordPress, we actually saw the WordPress appearing in the user agent. Uh, so they'll take that and uh, start blocking it. Okay, so you, you basically, um, with the DNS servers, you route all your Flipkart.com traffic to them and then they forward yes, it to you? Yes, so I mean, that is how we move traffic. Okay. I mean, the other option being BGP, but uh, the routing uh, scene in Asia is very, very bad. Uh, just to give an example, with one of the ISPs, we tried doing a Anycast. Uh, so we tried Anycast in three locations, uh, Delhi, uh, Bombay, and Chennai. And what we saw was all the traffic just shifted to Chennai. I mean, even though I had a box right in Delhi, right next to the server, which was hosting the Anycast, but it was all going to Chennai. Uh, so BGP is a very gray area. Uh, plus, you always also give away the control of your uh, BGP advertisements. Right. So, um, the thing is that DNS servers are something that are not in your control, right? No, but, uh, so we have a very yeah. low TTL. Uh, if you look up flipkart.com, okay. we have about 60 to 90 seconds. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, we are currently contemplating on... Uh, Working with Arbor, okay. uh, 
can you can you throw some lights on what are uh, what have been your bad experience with arbor it's not with arbor particularly it's the people who are uh, using that equipment they don't know what is the capability of the equipment it's you know like having a firewall i can give you a firewall but if you don't know how to use it how to tweak it it is not the capability of the firewall it's the capability of the user that's actually limiting them and also the other thing is uh, i think uh, in india the isps don't have enough capacity uh, i won't name the isp but one of them has about uh, 5 to 10 gb of mitigation capacity but it's advertised as about 100 so hey um i have a question about uh, about an api not uh, about the websites sure so i have an api which is uh, by nature it's a public api uh because it provides um, because it's part of a search as a service and uh, so now i am a, i am possibly thinking how can it be misused by you by a ddos attack right because there is no authentication in most cases in that api so even with authentication uh, you can't prevent against yeah. a ddos i mean the authentication is going to be done by api yeah. or any other service for that matter i mean if we go back to that uh, this slide you know there is actually nothing you can do here yeah right <laughs> the people so are trying to, to all get on to board, uh, so. to mitigate it i have uh, what what else do you suggest for an api how do you mitigate the ddos attack for a public api see again you have to uh, it's about uh, muscling it out you know in this case if we have maybe you know 10 more trains or a longer train with more seating capacity mm -hmm. that is the only way you can solve it so but there is a limit right so let's say if you're hoping for uh, 100 requests per second uh, you can plan for maybe 1000 but if you start planning for a million to mitigate it i mean there's going to be significant cost associated with it uh, so you could take help of people like uh, cloudflare or ultra or arbor by itself it's on the same lines you mention about uh, home grown yeah application solution for this right yes. uh, what kind of solution was it? and then you had some points about logs you know doing more analysis but what is specific in the application that so was uh, done? because that, like i mentioned you know it's our application so yeah. we know it best so we're doing uh, we are aggregating all logs from all web servers or actually all uh, internet facing applications so basically logging as much activity and then being proactive enough to know that there's a pattern coming yeah. is that so there are uh, some patterns we know of okay. and there's some patterns we can actually look at and you know start investigating okay uh, we are not there at the artificial intelligence level to you know automatically no, start blocking stuff I, I, but okay uh, so the whole uh, thing with that is uh, with so let's say you have a, a api for flipkart you have a, a seller platform for flipkart marketplace and you have the customer facing website now if i see a attack on the seller side um, i can take that information back and actually start blocking or stay, take preventive actions on the customer side before it actually starts happening so it's a uh, global feedback system so from all applications i have that feedback okay. and then once i have blocked them on the firewall uh, so what i've done is uh, the firewall is sitting at the edge of the network so once i block it there i'm st if i still see traffic from the user i mean i'm still i'm getting my firewall logs as well i do not unblock them i mean as uh, being a internet company we unblock our users after x amount of time and that's very small you know like 10 15 minutes sort of thing uh, so we we have that feedback loop that even after being blocked if you're still attacking us we will not unblock you okay so it's not uh, totally a preventive solution you have to have some you know there'll be some initial attack that will come in for us to get that data to identify and then build on <laughs> Uh, so for the home room solution you have uh, like your own http protocol decoders and everything no no, no. <clears throat> we are doing a, a log aggregation okay. and analysis that's all we're doing okay okay uh, so we're using logstash and then we are putting all that data into elastic search okay uh, so you can compare it to a splunk okay 
So when did you understood the first attack pattern? Like, I mean, did the site go down? How did you started doing the solutioning? I think it was the third or fourth time. In the last four months is when we, what we uh, is, uh, when we've seen a rise in the number of attacks that we had. The first attack we actually saw was in uh, 2011. And after that, the attack started in December. And as a whole, they've uh, started increasing. Uh, So with the amplification attacks, there wasn't anything we could do. I mean, it was just a muscle uh, muscle game that you have to have the ISPs mitigated. Uh, In terms of uh, the application layer attack, so we we have graphs for everything, the QPS that we're doing, the amount of data that we're pushing out per request, uh, not per request, like through the website, um, and also at the network side. So we saw spikes in bandwidth. So we started investigating. You know, we hadn't, we, we also saw a spike in, not really a spike, but an increase in the number of uh, incoming requests. Uh, so first thing was, you know, we went and checked with marketing if they had something going on, but we didn't really find anything there. It took about, I think two, three hours to actually find out what the problem was. So very interesting thing. I mean, uh, Nginx also has a thing called a lingering timeout. I mean, that is when we learned about it, where if the uh, request doesn't come in within five seconds, which is the default value, it drops the request. So we saw this pattern that the requests were dropping after five seconds, but we just had no clue why. Um, in log slash, you must be capturing HTTP logs. Uh, yeah. What about other attacks like uh, NTP or uh, DNS? For for that, uh, no, see NTP. I don't have a port open on the firewall. I'm not hosting a server. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it's choking my internet pipe. Even if I'm dropping it, I'm dropping it at my doorstep. Yeah, but but uh, can you capture the logs for that? You can. Uh, I have firewall logs. So you are capturing the firewall logs yeah, as well. Yeah. So like uh, the net screen, they they have uh, the number of packets per IP and protocol matching. Mm-hmm. Okay. Aren't you compromising your security by describing so many of the uh, protections checks that you are doing? No, I actually have a very generic uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.